Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and today we will study ultrasound appearances of thyroid. The thyroid gland is located in the neck region. It is divided into two lobes, the right lobe and the left lobe and these two lobes are connected together through the isthmus and the thyroid has a hyperechoic appearance and over here is the trachea it is having shadows due to presence of air and interior to the thyroid are the strap muscles these are the strap muscles and these anechoic regions are the common carotid arteries in cross section we start off with thyromegaly that is the enlargement of the thyroid gland when the ap diameter is more than two centimeters and the isthmus is more than four millimeters this is suggestive of thyromegaly and in the longitudinal view we can measure the length of the thyroid gland the normal value is around 4 cm and if it is more than 4 cm it can be a signal of thyromegaly. The average weight of the thyroid gland is around 25 grams and another term that is commonly used for thyromegaly is goiter that is also the abnormal enlargement of thyroid gland which can be due to many reasons such as nodular hyperplasia or cancer or thyroiditis we will see all these cases now nodular hyperplasia can have many appearances this image shows internal cystic components and multiple septations here is another case of nodular hyperplasia having internal cystic components and a spongy appearance. They can also have thick walls or masses attached to the wall of the nodule. These are called mural nodules. Here is an image showing hypervascularity on color doppler another feature of nodular hyperplasia a colloid nodule will have a cystic lesion that is filled with echogenic colloid crystals here you can see only one crystal in this image it is hyperechoic here is another image of colloid nodule having multiple colloid crystals that are hyperechoic and they can also have comet tail artifacts in this image you can see the comet tail artifacts more clearly usually these type of appearances are benign such cystic appearances or appearances with internal septations are usually benign a follicular adenoma is a hypoechoic mass here it is more hypoechoic as compared to the thyroid tissue and the halo is even more hypoechoic so like it is appearing more darker this type of appearance can be malignant here is a longitudinal view showing follicular adenoma a hypoechoic mass with a hypoechoic halo follicular carcinoma is the malignant form of this case this will have a hypoechoic halo a hypoechoic nodule and it can have some cystic areas now these type of appearances overlap with other appearances 
so we cannot confirm it on ultrasound. A transverse view of follicular carcinoma also containing calcifications. Here you can see a thin hypoechoic halo and cystic areas. Papillary carcinoma is a more common form of malignancy in the thyroid. It usually appears as hypoechoic lesions inside the thyroid and they may also have large calcifications but mostly they are hypoechoic lesions. In this image you can see a hypoechoic structure with calcified walls with some posterior acoustic shadowing. This can also be an appearance of papillary cancer. Here is another image of papillary carcinoma, a hypoechoic lesion with calcified hyperechoic walls. Papillary cancer can also have a cystic form in which you will see cystic components and also has septations and solid components. Here is a transverse view showing cystic papillary cancer, a cystic mass with solid components. Anaplastic cancers are larger in size, so you can differentiate them from other cancers due to their larger size. They appear as hypoechoic and they can also deviate the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. A lymphoma can involve the entire thyroid gland. It can lead to enlargement of the thyroid and also giving it a heterogeneous appearance. In this case you can see an enlarged thyroid gland with heterogeneous echotexture suggestive of a lymphoma. Metastasis to the thyroid can have variable appearances based on the type of primary cancer. Usually they are solid heterogeneous masses inside the thyroid. Now we move on to parenchymal diseases of the thyroid starting off with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It can cause hypothyroidism in the patient. There is enlargement of the thyroid and hypoechoic nodules that will be scattered throughout the parenchyma of the thyroid. In this image you can also see hypoechoic nodules scattered throughout the thyroid. Proper diagnosis is made clinically and serologically along with ultrasound appearances because these appearances overlap with other diseases as well. So we need proper clinical correlation. On color Doppler, Hashimoto's thyroiditis gives hypervascularity. This type of appearance is called thyroid inferno. Graves disease is a common cause for hyperthyroidism. In this the thyroid can appear enlarged and it can also appear homogeneous without any nodules. In this image you can see heterogeneous areas in the thyroid but if we compare it to Hashimoto's thyroiditis it is less heterogeneous. So the echo texture is somewhat smoother in Graves disease. And also remember Hashimoto's thyroiditis is hypothyroidism and 
Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. Graves' disease on Doppler can also give hypervascularity, that is, thyroid inferno, but it is more common in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Subacute thyroiditis, which is also known as de Quervain's thyroiditis, involves both lobes of the thyroid bilaterally. We will see hypoechoic regions in both thyroid lobes. Here is another case of subacute thyroiditis showing hypoechoic areas bilaterally in the right and left lobes. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and today we will study breast ultrasound image appearances. Here we have the images of normal breast. The uppermost layer is the skin. This is the hyperechoic layer. And below that is the subcutaneous zone. It is usually hypoechoic as compared to the tissues below. And the largest region is the memory zone. It usually has mixed echogenicity. Most of the pathologies occur in this zone. And this hyperechoic area is the fibroglandular tissue. These hyperechoic slanted or diagonal lines are Cooper ligaments. This striated structure is the pectoral muscle. The retromammary zone lies between the pectoral muscle and the mammary zone. Usually it appears smaller because it is compressed due to probe pressure. And this shadowing over here is due to the rib. Here we have more images of normal breast. We can see the three zones and the fibroglandular tissue which is hyperechoic. Usually the retromammary zone is below this fibroglandular tissue but it is not always the case. Breast pathologies can be classified by using a system known as BIRADS. It stands for Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. In total, it has seven categories. In BIRADS 0, we need further images. We need more scans such as mammograms or ultrasound scans. BIRADS 1 is for normal breast tissue where there is no mass or no distortion, no lesion. Both these images are BIRADS 1. A simple cyst will appear as an anechoic structure with posterior enhancement. The cyst will be round or ovoid with a smooth hyperechoic border. It is classified as BIRADS 2, which is benign. A complicated cyst will have fat fluid levels and internal echoes. These are fat fluid levels. The low density fluid is at the top and the high density fat is at the bottom. Now these cysts may resemble malignant lesions. That is why a follow up is needed. Examples of complicated cysts include oil cysts and galactoseals. A fibroadenoma is a benign tumor which will appear as a hypoechoic round or ovoid mass. It may have a hyperechoic rim known as a pseudocapsule and it has a parallel orientation. It is wider than tall. You can see it is wider 
instead of being taller. This is a sign of benign lesion. It is classified as BIRADS2, which is benign. However, routine screening mammography should be done. Here we have another image of fibroadenoma. It has a smooth border. It may have calcifications. You can see the pseudo capsule here, and it has a parallel orientation. It is wider than tall. A lipoma will appear as a hyperechoic rounded mass. Usually, hyperechoic rounded masses are benign. It has a BIRADS score of 2. Despite this appearance, routine screening mammography should be done. Hyperechoic masses that are ovoid, rounded, or well circumscribed are usually benign. Another benign feature is the parallel orientation in which it is wider than tall. Examples include angiolipoma, hemangioma, hamartoma. They usually appear as hyperechoic masses with a hyperechoic border. Here we have an image of intramammary lymph node. They have a hypoechoic outer cortex. This is the cortex and a hyperechoic central mediastinum, which is hyperechoic usually due to fat. They are classified as BIRADS2. A neurofibroma is a rare benign tumor which appears as a hypoechoic mass with posterior enhancement. Now it is very tricky because it resembles a cyst, so it can be misdiagnosed very easily, but it is a rare lesion. A sebaceous cyst is a complex cyst which is present closer to the skin. Here you can see it is present just below the skin and it is even involving the skin so this superficial location can help us in diagnosing sebaceous cyst it is classified as BIRADS2 a simple cyst containing a small hyperechoic calculus is usually a milk of calcium cyst these cysts are also benign. Eggshell calcifications are small calcifications which may have shadowing if they are a bit dense. They have a BIRADS score of 2. Complex cysts are rated as BIRADS 3 because they need a follow up exam. Usually thin hyperechoic septations are benign but they still need a follow up so that is why it is rated as BIRADS3. Clustered microcysts will have a group of cysts clustered together. The diameter is less than 3 mm and septations may be present. It is rated as BIRADS3 because follow-up is required. Fat necrosis has a variety of appearances. In the acute phase, the lesion is new, so it may appear as a hyperechoic lesion due to edema. Fat necrosis appearances overlap with malignant lesions, so a follow-up is required. So it is rated as BIRADS3. Fat necrosis enters late stage after 1.5 years. It will have calcified walls 
which give posterior acoustic shadowing. Now we move on to Byrad's categories which have chance of malignancy. Byrad's 4 has three subcategories. In 4A, the chance of malignancy is between 2 to 10 percent. B is 10 to 49 percent and 4C is 50 to 94 percent. Byrad's 5 has greater than 95 percent chance of malignancy and by red 6 is a biopsy proven malignancy. Usually hypoechoic masses with irregular walls or a spiculated appearance are malignant and they have a taller than wide orientation. Here we have a case of lymph node metastasis. We are comparing it with a non-malignant lymph node. The cortex is very thick, which gives it an abnormally hypoechoic appearance. It is usually a sign of malignancy. Intraductal papilloma is not very common. Its appearance usually involves dilated ducts and a well defined nodule. It is rated as BIRADS 4 and biopsy is advised. Intracystic papillary carcinoma consists of a complex cyst with a thick mural based nodule. This nodule will be attached to the wall, it will not move around. Here we have another image of intracystic papillary carcinoma. This one has a thick isoechoic septation as well. These thick isoechoic septations are usually a sign of malignancy as opposed to the thin hyperechoic septation which is usually benign. And here is a large thick mural nodule. Ductal carcinoma in situ will have hypoechoic masses which will be microlobulated which means they have these type of outpouchings and there is no enhancement which means it is a solid mass. In this image the mass involves the ducts so it appears elongated. Usually these hypoechoic masses involving the duct are ductal carcinoma in situ. Invasive ductal carcinoma is the most common form of breast cancer. It also has variable appearances. One of them is a circumscribed mass, hypoechoic mass with some calcifications which are usually invasive ductal carcinoma. Here we have another case of invasive ductal carcinoma. We have an ill-defined hypoechoic mass and it has a non-parallel orientation. It is taller than wide. The AP diameter will be more than the horizontal measurement. It also has posterior shadowing which is usually a sign of grade 1 invasive ductal carcinoma but it is not always the case. Here we have invasive ductal carcinoma with posterior acoustic enhancement. This enhancement is usually a sign of a higher grade cancer. It also has a spiculated appearance suggesting a malignant lesion. It is rated as BIRADS 4C. Here we have another image of invasive ductal carcinoma showing us a circumscribed hypoechoic mass with uniform internal echoes. It also has posterior enhancement suggesting a high grade cancer. You can see that invasive ductal carcinoma has 
lots of appearances. Ultimately, it is confirmed with biopsy. Mastitis is the inflammation of breast tissue. Its appearances consist of hyperechoic fat lobules and some hypoechoic areas. Another distinguishing feature is that it has thickened skin. Here you can see the skin is very thick as compared to the normal image. These are the features of mastitis. Duct ectasia involves dilated duct with branching tubular anechoic structures with the diameter measuring more than 2 mm. The normal ducts are somewhat difficult to visualize. They usually have mixed echoes. Here we have a case of infected and inflamed cyst. It has thick isoechoic walls and it has dependent debris which means this debris will settle down due to gravity. This is the gravity dependent side. This debris will move in accordance with the patient position. This debris will move. Using this feature we can differentiate it from a mural nodule. Another feature is seen on Doppler. It is the presence of increased blood flow in the thick wall. A normal breast implant is anechoic with a double layered hyperechoic shell. And these are the normal breast tissues. In an implant rupture, we have a step ladder sign which are linear horizontal hyperechoic bands representing folds of a collapsed shell. It suggests intracapsular rupture. A silicone granuloma suggests extracapsular rupture and gives us a snowstorm sign. In this we have a hyperechoic circumscribed superficial border with dirty posterior shadowing. This shadowing is grayish. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and today we will study scrotal ultrasound. We have longitudinal and transverse views of the testes. In the longitudinal view, the testis is more elongated than in the transverse view. The normal testis has an homogeneous echo texture with a medium level echogenicity. The length is between 4 to 5 centimeters, the width is between 2 to 4 centimeters, and the diameter is between 3 to 5 centimeters. Its volume is approximately 20 ml and the scrotal wall thickness is between 2 to 8 millimeters. The tunica vaginalis and albuginia are seen together as a hyperechoic border outlining the testis. In this transverse view, we can see both the testes. Here is the right testes and here is the left testes. The mediastinum testis is seen as a linear hypoechoic structure in the testis. The RT testis is not easily visualized but appears hypoechoic and is located near the mediastinum testis. The spectral Doppler waveforms of the testis have a low resistance flow. This is the systolic velocity and here is the diastolic velocity. It has a large quantity of forward diastolic flow. In polyorchidism, there is an extra testis which is isoechoic to normal testis. It will be smaller in size. It is also called supernumerary testis. Here is another image showing the extra testis behind the right testis. 
Cryptorchidism refers to absence of testes and also includes undescended, ectopic or atrophic testes. Here we see a small hypoechoic, atrophic, undescended testes in the inguinal region. In this transverse view we can see the atrophic left testis is smaller and more hypoechoic than the normal right testis. In a hydrocele, there is an anechoic fluid collection seen outside the testis. You can also notice posterior acoustic enhancement over here. Appendix testis is an accessory testicular tissue found between the upper pole of the testis and the head of the epididymis. It is more easily visualized when there is a hydrocele. It can measure 1 to 4 millimeters in length. In torsion of appendix testis, it is enlarged and can measure 6 millimeters or more. There will be absence of internal flow on Doppler. This feature can tell us that there is torsion of the appendix testis. Encysted spermatic cord hydrocele is a fluid collection above the testis. This fluid collection will not surround the testis and won't connect with the peritoneum above. It is usually anechoic and oval shaped. The funicular spermatic cord hydrocele will communicate with the peritoneum. As you can see, it is open from here. So there is a connection with the peritoneum. It is the second type of spermatic cord hydrocele. A hematocele and a pyocele have similar appearances. They consist of a complex cyst outside the testis with internal echoes and septations. Posterior enhancement will be present. A hematocele contains blood as a result of trauma and a pyocele consists of pus and is due to infection. A scrotolith is a calcification in the scrotal sac. It will appear hyperechoic and can be mobile. It often has posterior shadowing. In this image we can also see a hydrocele. Tunica albuginea cyst is a small anechoic cyst in this layer which may be unilocular or multilocular which means it can have septations. The diameter is between 2 to 5 millimeters and there are no solid internal echoes. In tubular ectasia of reti testis, there are numerous small anechoic cysts which give a honeycomb or fishnet appearance. In this image, there is no internal flow seen with Doppler and there is no mass effect. These features differentiate it from testicular tumors and cancers. A varicocele means there is dilatation of the pampiniform plexus which are various small veins in the spermatic cord. The dilated veins give a serpentine appearance which looks like this. There are different ways to grade a varicocele. The one used here is based on mean diameter of the veins. There are three grades. In grade 1, the mean diameter is 3 to 4 millimeters. On Valsalva maneuver, there is 1 millimeter increase in diameter. In grade 2 varicocele, the mean diameter is 4 to 5 millimeters. On Valsalva maneuver, the diameter increases by 1.2 to 1.5 millimeters. In grade 3 varicocele, the mean diameter is 5 millimeters or more. And on Valsalva maneuver, the increase in diameter is greater than 1.5 millimeters. Limited testicular microlithiasis 
consists of tiny calcifications inside the testis that are less than 5 in number. Here we have 3 calcifications. They don't have any shadowing and measure 1 to 3 millimeters in diameter. Classic testicular microlithiasis will have 5 or more tiny calcifications. Here we can see many small calcifications, but there are still some areas which don't have any calcifications. In diffuse testicular microlithiasis, you can see a large number of tiny calcifications in both the right and left testes. In the case of testicular sarcoidosis, the testis contains multiple hypoechoic structures spread throughout the organ. Cystadenoma of the reti testis is a rare tumor. The cystic structure will contain multiple septations followed by posterior acoustic enhancement. Here is another image of cystadenoma of reti testis. It is a cystic structure with multiple septations. A lipoma in a testis will appear as a well-defined hyperechoic mass without any posterior acoustic shadowing. Fibrous pseudotumor is found outside the testis as a solid mass with variable echogenicity. We can distinguish it from tumors and cancers by looking at the cause. It occurs due to infection, surgery or trauma. Adrenal rest tumor is associated with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It is bilateral and usually appears hypoechoic or heterogeneous. Here is a Doppler image of adrenal rest tumor. It shows low internal vascularity on color Doppler. Adenomatoid tumor has variable appearances. It can appear hyperechoic or isoechoic to testes or heterogeneous. Usually it is well defined and oval shaped. Splenogonadal fusion is a rare congenital condition in which splenic tissue is found in the testes. You can see that it somewhat resembles splenic tissue. It is homogeneous and either hypoechoic or isoechoic to the testes. On color Doppler, the splenic tissue will show hypervascularity. It is difficult to distinguish it from a testicular malignancy. Lymphoma is a testicular malignancy which is not very common. There will be a hypoechoic, ill-defined mass. Both the testis and the epididymis will be enlarged. On color Doppler, there will be hypervascularity inside the mass. Metastasis to testes are very rare. They have variable echogenicity and can be bilateral. Here is an image of scrotal hernia. There is herniation of abdominal contents in the scrotal sac. Usually peritoneal fat or bowel loops are herniated. Here we see peritoneal fat next to the testis in the scrotal sac. In testicular torsion, there is twisting of the spermatic cord, which can cut off blood supply to the testis. One classic sign on ultrasound is the whirlpool sign. It appears as a spiral twist in the spermatic cord. There are alternating hyperechoic and hypoechoic rings. This is a transverse view showing both the testes. There is torsion of left testes. You can see it is hyperechoic and larger than the normal right testes, and there is also a scrotal wall thickening. Here we have the whirlpool sign. We can see it better with color Doppler. You can compare it with the normal spermatic cord flow.
Also, there is a hydrocele caused by the torsion. In case of partial testicular torsion, there will be reduced blood flow within the testis. We can examine that with spectral Doppler. Here we have the normal spectral waveform showing normal systolic and diastolic flow. And over here there is absent diastolic flow. The resistive index will be greater than 0 0.75. In this image, we have complete testicular torsion. Color Doppler is applied, but there is complete absence of blood flow within the testis. This image shows a late finding of testicular torsion. The testis appears heterogeneous. The hypoechoic areas represent necrosis, and the hyperechoic areas represent hemorrhage. Orchitis is the inflammation of the testis. The testis will be hypoechoic and swollen. The scrotal wall thickening will also be seen. On color Doppler, hypervascularity will be seen in the inflamed testis. You can see a large amount of blood flow in the affected testis. Focal orchitis can also occur and we will see a focal hypoechoic and hypervascular area. In testicular ruptures and infarcts, there is disruption of tunica albuginea. The testis appears heterogeneous and a hematocele can also be seen. Testicular fracture is due to trauma. There will be a hypoechoic line passing through the testis. A portion of the testis has been separated. This hypoechoic line is blood. A seminoma is a type of germ cell tumor. Usually it appears as a homogeneous hypoechoic mass. In this image there is a large seminoma. If the mass is large, it can appear heterogeneous. A yolk sac tumor is the most common testicular tumor in children. It is very rare in adults. It is also known as endodermal sinus tumor of testis. There is a large heterogeneous testis. Embryonic cell carcinoma is a malignant lesion of testis. It can appear as a large heterogeneous testicular mass. Testicular teratoma is a mixed germ cell tumor. This tumor has a heterogeneous mass with cystic areas. Here is another image of teratoma. It has a cystic mass with multiple septations. A testicular teratoma can also have hyperechoic fatty areas and no posterior shadowing. A teratoma can have variable appearances. An epidermoid cyst is a rare benign tumor. It has an onion skin or world appearance consisting of alternating hypoechoic and hyperechoic rings. Here we have another image of an epidermoid cyst. It has an onion skin appearance. It will not have any internal flow on Doppler. A burned out testis tumor appears as a hyperechoic mass within the testis. Usually it is calcified and has posterior acoustic shadowing. It is malignant. The normal epididymis is slightly hypoechoic. The head measures 5 to 12 millimeters, the body measures 2 to 4 millimeters, and the tail measures 2 to 5 millimeters. Epididymitis is the inflammation of the epididymis. Here the head is enlarged and also heterogeneous. In these images we can see the body and the tail of the epididymis. You can notice that in epididymitis, the body and tail are heterogeneous as compared to the normal images.
on color doppler there is increased blood flow due to inflammation the peak systolic velocity or psv will be more than 15 centimeters per second in an epididymal abscess there will be a hypoechoic or heterogeneous area there is absence of any internal blood flow on doppler the epididymis will be enlarged epididymal head cyst is seen as an anechoic well-defined round cyst in the epididymal head with posterior acoustic enhancement hello everyone this is dr sam and this video is about eye ultrasound the eye can be visualized very well in our transverse view this thin layer is the cornea behind it is the anechoic anterior chamber posterior to it is the lens it is also anechoic with a thin hyperechoic border the vitreous chamber is the largest chamber in the eye it is also anechoic the innermost layer is the retina and just behind the retina is the choroid behind these two layers is the sclera this hyperechoic bright layer is sclera and finally this hypoechoic area is the optic nerve in a cataract there is increased thickness of lens walls and will also be hyperechoic here is another case of cataract we see a hyperechoic thick lens this is an image of intraocular lens implant it is hyperechoic and it will have reverberation artifacts it will look like this ectopia lentis refers to dislocation of the lens mostly it occurs due to trauma here we see the lens in the posterior aspect of the vitreous chamber this is another case of ectopia lentis we see the lens displaced from its original location vitreous hemorrhage refers to bleeding into the vitreous chamber in the acute phase we will see scattered mobile mildly hyperechoic dots and lines in the vitreous chamber this appears because of the presence of blood which is denser than vitreous gel in chronic vitreous hemorrhage we will start to see hyperechoic membranes or bands in the vitreous chamber these bands will move around much less they will have less mobility as compared to acute vitreous hemorrhage in retinal detachment the retina is separated we will see a hyperechoic folded membrane floating in the vitreous chamber in this image of retinal detachment the detached retina forms a cord this cord is only attached from one end and will move around in the vitreous chamber a retinal detachment in which there is a hole or a tear in the retina is called regmatogenous detachment here is another image of a regmatogenous detachment a tear can be seen in the retina here confirming that it is a regmatogenous detachment a posterior vitreous detachment also called hyaloid detachment occurs when there is a separation between the retina and the vitreous body it looks similar to a retinal detachment but there is one main difference the hyperechoic membrane will be more mobile than a retinal detachment this membrane will move and float around really fast in the vitreous chamber this is also a regmatogenous form of detachment vitreoretinal traction can occur in elderly people the vitreous gel starts to liquefy because of degeneration 
This condition is called synthesis sinuless. This liquefied gel forms an anechoic laguna. A hole can form anywhere in the thinned vitreous membrane and fluid from the lacuna goes through this hole and pulls away the vitreous membrane or hyaloid membrane from the retina. That is why it is called vitreoretinal traction because the vitreous membrane is pulled away from the retina by the fluid from the lacuna. It is also a pragmatogenous form of detachment. This will also cause vitreous hemorrhage, which appears as mixed echoes in the vitreous chamber. The hemorrhage makes the lacuna more prominent. In this image, we can see a detached hyaloid membrane with a lacuna present in the center. In proliferative vitreoretinopathy, we will see thick retinal leaves and a triangle or funnel shaped configuration is formed. This is termed the triangle sign. The detached retina will be rigid and non mobile. There is proliferation of posterior hyaloid interface and the retinal surface, which makes the retina thick, hardened, and unable to move around. This is another image of proliferative vitreoretinopathy. We see the triangle sign again with thick non mobile retina. Sometimes we may also see transvitreal membrane at the anterior retina. Exudative retinal detachment is a non regmatogenous detachment. No retinal tear occurs in this detachment. We do not see any holes or tears in the retina. Due to inflammation or tumor, there is accumulation of subretinal fluid which separates and lifts the retina from its original location. Here is another image of an exudative retinal detachment. There is no tear present and there is accumulation of subretinal fluid. A choroidal detachment has its own specific features on ultrasound. There will be two convex shaped hyperechoic bands which will not move around and have a fixed position. This is another case of choroidal detachment. We see two hyperechoic bands in a fixed position. Sometimes a choroidal detachment is associated with hemorrhage. In this case, mixed echoes are seen within both convex shaped structures. On color Doppler, both hyperechoic bands will have blood flow because choroid is a vascular membrane. Suprachoroidal hemorrhage refers to accumulation of blood between the choroid and the sclera. In most cases, we will see multilobulated hyperechoic or heterogeneous choroid. Tractional retinal detachment usually occurs in diabetic patients. The most common cause is diabetic retinopathy. A tent shaped detachment is seen. This detachment is immobile, which means it will not move around. This is another case of tractional retinal detachment. There are two tent shaped detachments seen. These will be non mobile. In retinoscosis, the retina splits into two layers. It can be associated with a detached retina. Optic disc drusen is a condition in which a calcified hyperechoic nodule is found over optic nerve head. It is also called hyaline bodies. If the calcified nodule is large enough, it may have posterior acoustic shadowing. Persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous is a condition in which a hyperechoic band is seen extending from the optic nerve head to the posterior part of the lens. One end of this band is attached to the optic nerve head. 
and the other end is attached to the back of the lens. Here we have another case of persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. The hyperechoic band here is thicker than the previous one. One end is attached to the optic nerve head and the other end attaches to the posterior part of the lens. On Doppler, this hyperechoic band will show vascularity. We will see blood flow inside this band. In asteroid hyalosis, small hyperechoic mobile non shadowing structures will be seen floating in vitreous chamber. Choroidal melanoma is an intraocular tumor. We will see a choroidal mass with medium level echoes. When we apply color Doppler, we will find internal vascularity. Most common shape of this tumor is lenticular or biconvex shape. Choroidal melanoma can also be dome shaped. Choroidal detachment can also be seen in this image. Here is an image of choroidal melanoma with Doppler applied. We can see vascularity inside the mass. Ciliary melanoma is another intraocular tumor. The mass is found in the upper part of the image at the superior anterior aspect of vitreous chamber. This mass will also have medium level echoes. Choroidal metastasis present as choroidal thickening on ultrasound. It is usually bilateral, which means it is present in both eyes. Osseous choristoma is a tumor that occurs in young women. It can be bilateral. It is also called choroidal osteoma. A hyperechoic mass near the optic disc is seen. Optic disc is the head of optic nerve. This hyperechoic mass has posterior acoustic shadowing. Choroidal hemangioma has a non specific appearance on ultrasound. We will see a thickened choroidal layer. Retinoblastoma is a malignancy of the retina. A hyperechoic and heterogeneous mass is present in the vitreous chamber. If it has large calcifications, posterior shadowing will be seen. Internal vascularity will be present on Doppler. Thysis bulbi, which is also called end stage eye, is a non functioning eye. The eye is small, deformed, and filled with calcifications. It occurs after a severe eye injury. Ultrasound is helpful in visualizing ocular foreign bodies. Hard materials such as glass or metal will appear hyperechoic. Denser material will have posterior acoustic shadowing. Here is the shadowing behind the object. In a globe rupture, the interior chamber can be collapsed. Hyperechoic layering debris is present. This is the debris. There is loss of normal spherical contour of the eye. The eyeball has lost its spherical shape. Scleral buckling is seen here, deforming the eye, and the volume of the globe will be reduced. Tenon's capsule is a dense layer of connective tissue surrounding the eyeball. If there is fluid accumulation in the tenon's capsule and the optic nerve sheath, it will give a T sign. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam. And this video is about salivary glands ultrasound. Here we have a longitudinal view and a transverse view of a normal parotid gland. The parotid gland is hyperechoic and has a homogeneous echo texture. We can see a smooth echo texture of the gland.
This is the normal submandibular gland. It can be isoechoic or hypoechoic to adjacent structures. It also has a homogeneous echo texture. These hypoechoic structures are the mylohyoate and hyoglossus muscles. And on the right side, we have the normal sublingual glands. We can see both of them in this image as it is a transverse view. They can be isoechoic or hypoechoic to adjacent structures. Most of the pathologies involve the parotid and submandibular glands. In this image, we can see a normal parotid duct. It has a small diameter. Sialolithiasis refers to presence of stones within the salivary gland ducts. We can see a hyperechoic stone within the parotid duct, which has led to a dilated parotid duct. The stone is also casting a posterior acoustic shadow. Stones are a common cause of dilated parotid duct. Here is a case of a stone within a submandibular gland duct. We can see the hyperechoic stone with posterior acoustic shadowing. Sial adenitis is the inflammation of salivary glands. In this image, the submandibular gland is affected. We can see an enlarged heterogeneous submandibular gland. The left image shows a normal color flow pattern in submandibular gland. We only find few Doppler signals, whereas in the case of sialadenitis, we see hypervascularity within the gland. We find more Doppler signals within the gland. In a parotid gland abscess, we will find hypoechoic and heterogeneous areas along with some hyperechoic areas. We will not see any internal flow on color Doppler. No color flow will be seen inside the abscess. Parotitis is the inflammation of parotid gland. It occurs in cases such as mumps, an enlarged parotid gland is seen with hypoechoic and heterogeneous areas. We find an overall hypoechoic parotid gland, whereas the normal parotid gland is hyperechoic. Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disorder that affects the salivary glands. This also leads to enlarged salivary glands. In this image, we can see an enlarged parotid gland. Hypoechoic and heterogeneous areas are also seen. Here is another image of Sjogren's syndrome. We see many hypoechoic nodules within an enlarged parotid gland. Usually, the number of nodules increases over time. We may also find hyperechoic areas within the gland. These are usually due to fat deposition within the affected gland. Now, we move on to salivary gland tumors. Parotid pleomorphic adenoma 
is the most common salivary gland tumor, we will find a well defined hypoechoic mass with posterior acoustic enhancement. In some cases, this adenoma may also have multiple lobules. These are the chambers that are seen. This mass has multiple lobules or chambers along with posterior acoustic enhancement. The mass will be hypervascular on color Doppler. Many Doppler signals will be found within the mass. Warthen tumor is the second most common salivary gland tumor. The appearances overlap with a pleomorphic adenoma, but one distinguishing feature is that it contains sponge like anechoic lesions, but other features are similar to pleomorphic adenoma, such as a well defined hyperechoic mass with posterior enhancement. A Wharton tumor is also hypervascular on color Doppler. It will contain numerous Doppler signals. Malignancy in the parotid gland has various appearances, but it usually contains hypoechoic lesions, which are somewhat irregular in shape. Here is a case of lymphoma which has affected the parotid gland. We see a hypoechoic mass with mixed cystic and solid components. Benign lymphoepithelial lesions are usually seen in HIV positive patients. The parotid gland will contain complex cysts with thick septations and internal echoes. These are the septations, these bright walls within the complex cyst. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sam and this video is about adrenal gland ultrasound. In adults, adrenal glands are difficult to see on ultrasound especially the left adrenal gland which is very hard to find on ultrasound so usually the right adrenal gland is seen in newborns an adrenal gland is much easier to locate both of these images are of the right adrenal gland in the transverse view it is seen as a Y-shaped linear hypoechoic structure. And in the longitudinal view, it is seen above the upper pole of the kidney as a V-shaped hypoechoic linear structure. The first case is of adrenal cyst. It is an anechoic round structure, a right adrenal cyst will be seen between the liver and the right kidney. An adrenal adenoma is a benign tumor involving the adrenal gland. It has variable appearances. In this image, it is a hyperechoic round and ovoid mass and has a homogeneous echo texture. Usually it is less than 4 cm. This is a transverse view showing adrenal adenoma. Here it is hypoechoic. So some adenomas can be hypoechoic. It is a homogeneous mass and it is well circumscribed. We will not find any internal flow on Doppler. 
lipoma and myelolipoma are benign tumors a lipoma consists of fat tissues that is why it is appearing as a hypoechoic mass a myelolipoma consists of fat and bone marrow these masses are usually hyperechoic they are also well defined and are round or ovoid in shape and if these masses are very dense they may cast a posterior acoustic shadow a pheochromocytoma is another tumor that involves the adrenal glands they also have variable appearances the mass has a well defined shape and usually it has a heterogeneous echo texture and it may also have internal flow on doppler a pheochromocytoma may also appear as a complex cyst we can see internal echoes inside this cyst metastasis to the adrenal gland is common they have a heterogeneous echo texture in this image we see central fluid areas surrounded by solid components we do not see any well defined margin metastases also give variable appearances adrenal carcinoma is a cancer involving the adrenal glands the mass will have an irregular shape and it will be heterogeneous it may also contain calcifications we can see hyperechoic calcifications within the mass ultrasound is not a proper modality for imaging the adrenal glands due to difficulty in visualizing them that is why ct and mris are much better modalities for adrenal glands thank you so much for watching please subscribe and stay tuned for more imaging videos